Well, tonight we're here to present Gianluca Galletto's book, uh, Viva New York. It's a um, presentation of the ways in which New York changed and has become a different reality, especially from a productive point of view for innovation, innovation technology, and not only. Uh, and he's, it's in the form of seven letters that he writes, and it's in Italian because it's to let Italians know that New York is not only what they normally associate to it, that is the image that movies mostly and, and TV created. So it's a great pleasure to have Gianluca here to speak about New York to New Yorkers. It's, it's going to be a bit more tough than presenting New York to the Italians, but uh, we like challenges. And um, um, we have with us um, Antonio Mondo, who's a dear colleague here at New York University, um, and uh, a cultural institution in and of itself, uh, as the New York Times said. And then we have Mr. Uh, Alan Patrikov. He's a venture capitalist and a philanthropist. But to start the, uh, the evening, we have the great pleasure of having with us the person who wrote the foreword to the book, and uh, a person that made of his Italian identity a part of what he is and what he represents politically, and of the immigrant background from which he comes also an important part of his political decisions. And in this time in the history of the city, where it seems that the only danger that the city has are immigrants, I think it's very important to have an attitude like the one that Mr. de Blasio showed when he was mayor. Please welcome the ex-mayor of New York. Well, th thank you so much. I um, am a proud. Uh, graduate of New York University, and I was an Italian minor here. So to come back to Casa Italiana is a wonderful, wonderful feeling. I want to thank uh, everyone part of, who was a part of making this uh, evening happen, because it's uh, about as important a topic as we could, personally, uh, we could possibly think about. Reflections on our city and where we are and where we're going. And it's a time where we could use some more of that honest conversation, and it's true that uh, I have always looked through the prism of an immigrant family. Um, when I think about my grandparents who came here from southern Italy, uh, they went through a kind of culture shock I can't even imagine. My grandmother Anna, my grandfather Giovanni from small towns in the south of Italy, one day arriving in the harbor and encountering New York City. Both came to love this place and become deeply connected to it. And I, they did not get to see what would happen to me later on, but I think they'd be in one way shocked, in another way um, quite convinced that this was what America they hoped would be, to see their grandson become mayor of the city that they loved. But I think a powerful lesson I learned from my grandfather was that he had a sense of respecting all people, and he knew what it was like to be the other. And I could see in the way he treated people that he had been the other, that he had been excluded, that he had been underestimated, that he had not been valued. I will say for the record, my grandfather had a very, very thick accent. And if you spent a lot of time with him, you could understand what he was saying in English. But if you didn't, you might struggle. But I always say it's not his fault. He only had 70 years to learn English. <laughs> so, uh, and, but, the, but there was a message in that to me. This was one of the people I've loved most in my life and, and a great inspiration, a great role model. And yet, the way he spoke English was not the way most of the people around me did. And somewhere in that was a very simple, powerful uh, message that didn't matter how you presented yourself, what mattered, of course, was what was inside. But it wasn't uh, something I read in a book. It was something I experienced personally. I could tell he had been othered. I could tell he was different. And yet, he was a foundation for me. And he represented everything good about what could happen in this city and in this country. So now we turn to this wonderful book. Uh, I'm only going to say a few things very quickly because I've, had, I've been part of a much more extensive conversation about this book in Rome uh, at the Italian Senate. So I feel like I've gotten all of my feelings out uh, <laughs> about this book. But I'm so glad that Gianluca wrote it because it is truly a labor of love. And 
Uh, I've seen John Luca's work from the very beginning of a lot of what we did politically in the city. He was there and, and very much of the same philosophy and the same hope. And what I always appreciated was uh, he saw the possibilities. You know, so much of what happens in our lives, but particularly in our political lives, our government lives, is being told what we cannot do, self-limiting, uh, being convinced uh, that even something we need is not possible. I've always appreciated about John Luca that he started from the idea that we could go someplace else, that the fact that we hadn't been somewhere did not disqualify the possibility. So from the beginning, we talked about the idea of creating a more equal New York, and we talked about the idea of not just innovation for innovation's sake, but innovation that was inclusive. We talked about the idea that we could create a different kind of coalition for change. Now these powerful fundamental ideas, I mean we worked on them and some, some we did better on and some we did worse on, but the point was we tried to bring to life that which we had often been told was not possible. And here in the context of New York, uh, I always say to people there are many examples, there were, there were successes, there were failures, but if you ever want the quintessential example of something that was consistently treated as impossible, including by the very esteemed editorial boards and many wise observers. We were told from the beginning that pre-K for all, universal pre-K was physically impossible, financially impossible, would take uh, years and years and years. And I'm thrilled to say it took us only two years to give the right to every four-year-old in the city to have an education for free, a quality education for free. So, this is simply an example of, to some extent, the only way you're going to make change is to start from the very assumption that whatever we were shown in the past or whatever the conventional wisdom is, is inherently flawed and limited. But the other piece about this book that I love deeply is John Luca is writing a love letter also to his homeland. And I spoke with some of the Italian leaders who had read the book and saw how they were inspired by it because they've been through a very, very tough time in terms of the life of Italy and the changes Italy's going through in the political dynamics. Um, a lot of people are very depressed, honestly, about the prospects of a country that has contributed so much to the world. They need to be reminded of what's possible. They need to be shown models that can change lives. And I think John Luca's book does that admirably. So um, this is a wonderful panel, not only will you hear from the author himself, but also my old friend Alan Patrikoff, who has done so much good for this city. Uh, I want to also thank Antonio Monda, who's, uh, as I said, he's not a person, he's an institution. Uh, I don't know, I mean, that's, that's tough to carry that mantle, but you do it well. Uh, and I finally have to say that um, I'm blessed to have been able to serve the people of the city, and the only reason is before he can claim credit is because of Dante de Blasio, who's right here, who... <laughs> the charismatic star of the ad that propelled us into City Hall. But uh, tonight, um, I believe the most powerful thing you are going to experience is a world of possibilities and hope. And all I ask is, as you're listening, if you're moved by something, spread that word, live in that spirit. No matter how tough the moment may seem, uh, there are always extraordinary possibilities, but we have to feel it. It does not happen without us. We have to feel it. And John Luca, thank you for helping us to feel it. Thank you, everybody. Seduto allora. Buonasera, good evening. First of all, I want to thank the mayor for the wonderful and kind words. I want to thank Stefano Albertini. And uh, when Gianluca called me uh, a month ago or so, I was uh, flattered, but a little surprised. Say, so why ask me? I mean, we live in different worlds. We come from different fields. I don't know anything about politics or economics. And I don't know what he does, what he knows about films and, and literature, <laughs> but certainly more than I do about politics and economics. 
I started reading the book and I realized why he asked me this. First of all, it's a beautiful book. It's full of gems, full of interesting data. And, uh, and, but the most important thing about the book is the enthusiasm, the energy, the love for the city. And this is something that I share with Gianluca. It's a, it's a book written by a man who wants to do something. And he did already a lot. And uh, the, the, the book is, <coughs> the book witnesses what he did. What I like about the book is not only the energy and the vitality, the enthusiasm, but also the courage that he has in several passages. First of all, he strongly uh, fights against cliché and stereotypes. Cliché in Italy and in this country, uh, and in particular in this city. In Italy, for example, uh, we have uh, a line that is repeated and repeated. We have the most beautiful constitution in the world. Nobody knows the constitution in Italy. <laughs> Nobody knows other constitutions. So it's, can I say a bad word? No, okay, I will not say, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and um, stereotypes. New York is full of cynicism. There is no welfare. A lot of fake news that are repeated and repeated and repeated. The third um, reason why I like this book is because it's a book written by someone who is not a New Yorker, but became a New Yorker. And often, this is the right way to understand the heart of places. Let me go back for a second to my world, to cinema. Nobody understood Roma better than a man from Rimini, Federico Fellini, and more recently a man from Naples, Paolo Sorrentino. And Gianluca is a southerner, I am a southerner as well, and he understands New York because he loves it. Um, he also has the courage to attack his own party, his own side. There is a passage that I really liked about the danger of political correctness, and when he puts <coughs> at the same level the uh, bigot and chauvinist attitude of the right wing and the hypocrisy of the left wing. That's a courageous passage, and I was surprised, and I want to congratulate for that. I will not speak about housing because I didn't understand a single word about that. <laughs> I understood it's an important issue, but, and I understood that he did a lot about this, but um, I'm not the right person. And finally, there is another element that it's really uh, to admire. He is ironic and uh, self-ironic. He, he uses irony against himself. There is a chapter when it's repeated several times, better call Galletto. And it's a line that apparently either a city hall used to say when there was a problem or a trouble, let's call Galletto. And the way he says it, it's, it's fun and ironic. He speaks about skyscrapers, the new, what do you call now, the, 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 the finger sky, the horrible new, oh, yeah, the, uh, the super towers. Super, super yeah. Tall. yeah. He speaks about uh, politicians of the past, like Nixon, like Lincoln. I disagree about Lincoln, but we'll discuss this later. <laughs> and uh, about Kennedy. And, uh, and there are other elements that are very, very interesting and new to me. For example, I didn't know there are one million students in the city every year. People who are here for just to study. And I didn't know that until 2019, New York had uh, 65 million visitors, which is an incredible and amazing number. And finally, he Loves One year, per year. Per year, of course, per year. Uh, he loves uh, politics as much as, as uh, he loves uh, the city. For example, he goes back also in a, in a uh, only in a brief passage, but an important one, to the 70s when this city was in one of the eternal crises. And uh, the mayor of the time, Abraham Beam, as the president of the time, Gerald Ford, support, and the answer were two words, drop dead. 
He couldn't care less about New York. You know Washington never liked, uh, never liked New York. But uh, finally, what I think is really interesting and important, and I'm sorry that the Mayor de, uh, Mayor de Blasio had to leave, is uh, what he tries to do to <coughs> overcome the inequality of this city. He speaks, quoting Dickens, Tales of the C Two Cities, which was, I think, a motto of Mayor de Blasio. There are two cities in this place, the ultra-rich and, uh, as Margaret Thatcher would say, poorer and poorer. And this is absurd, obscene. And he has, with this book, given his, I say, un piccolo contributo, a contribution to win this inequality, and I congratulate for that. I have several other things that I want to say, but maybe it's, it's time yeah. to give the word to. Thank you, Thank first you. of all. Uh, <laughs> before I, I give the word to um, Alan, um, I want to thank everyone. Just a quick, uh, give a little bit of context of why we here in some ways, why I invited you, why I invited Alan. And it's also because the book is in Italian, although I wanted, I really cared about doing this in English because the book speaks about New York. It's not, it doesn't speak about Italy. I mean, in, in some ways, some, there are some references, but. And I'm working on the English version, complicated, but uh, um, <laughs> it takes a long time. This book, this book has sucked my life for the last few months. Um, so we hear, and, and so I wanted to, the topics that are discussed in the books are topics that some of you experienced. Uh, Alan is uh, someone who has done a lot for the city in many different ways, uh, and uh, is a venture capitalist who started venture capital, really, when it was really an embryonic uh, industry in the late 60s. Um, and so at, at the same time, I also wanted, I really cared about putting together someone like Alan was also involved in politics. So you're involved in so many things, and uh, and uh, you served also in different committees in the federal administration, etc. But Antonio, I called you exactly because of that. Because I thought I don't want to have a discussion with some economic journalist uh, that I already had, uh, or I, I want to have something. If somebody who knows, first of all, I wanted to have the feedback from someone who knows literature. And he, he knows what books are. He, he works with the biggest writers in the world. And so I wanted to hear this. How is this book <laughs> really, aside from, I'm really telling something that is almost mostly common knowledge. I'm not, I'm not telling anything uh, new in this book. I mean, if you go and you, you have data, you find it. But I wanted to hear, does it, does it convey a message the way I wrote it? Or not, and and so I'm extremely I'm extremely pleased. You, you are making me almost emotional tonight. I mean, I'm serious about this. So, before I, I just I, I want to give you a couple of other things. Then, so go back and thank everyone for coming. I want to thank Bacaza. I've been here when I was I used to be a regular when I was younger, um, and I want to say one thing about this association that we founded with a couple of other friends, and it's still embryonic. It's going to grow. It's called City. City is a word that means chair, uh, it's old English, um, pre-William the Conqueror invasion. <laughs> and, and the idea is that to have conversation like this about how in innovation that can help solve societal problems. Uh, because I, I embraced this innovation, I, I worked in finance for a long time and then I went to government and I, I got, in, I fell in love with all that rolls around making a city work better. And innovation for me is not just tech, it's also what pre-K for all was. That's changing the ways you use legislation, for example, or the assets you already have. Uh, so that's something that, uh, and I wanted to create a bridge with Italy with this association. So I want to thank Beatrice, Ulderico, and uh, Manuel, they're here. Um, so before, so I want to give a couple of things for, for Alan to talk about. And so let's go into the, in the, into the book, um, and I will, now we'll go back and forth, I so just wanted to have a conversation that is informal. Um, New York became uh, very clearly, and despite a lot of still lingering perception of the country, it's the second most important innovation tech hub in the world. 
it, it is rivaling Silicon Valley. Uh, in some cases, it has also um, overcome Silicon Valley. Like in May, there was a stat that came out that Manhattan has uh, more seed stage startup than uh, San Francisco for the first time. Seed stage startup are startup that are just born now, infants, let's say. Uh, that's what it means in jargon for people who are not there. Um, and venture capital itself, we went from, uh, well now we're running, I think, at about $30 billion every year invested, but we reached the peak of $55 billion in 2021. And in 10 years, it was only $2 billion invested before. And so you, you experienced all this. My thesis is that this was possible for a lot of endogenous um, factors of the city, but also because this, the government of the city was was a good government. It was a, a, a it was a deliberate choice in many ways. It started with Bloomberg, in many respects, and continued by the Blasio. And so my and that's why the letter to the Italians is and the Italians are a proxy for the rest of the world, really. Uh, and it's. You can make changes if you do the right things, like some of these initiatives that I talk about, Cornell Tech, the change at the Never Yard, all the things that have been happening. So, um, and that catapult in New York at the, at the forefront, not only of, of this innovation thing, but also, for example, in climate, climate change policy. New York used to be a laggard, and that's another, that's a, one of the misconceptions that people have in Europe. They all talk, if you talk about this, oh, New York, yeah, or the, US, the US, oh, yeah. You just like love carbon and, and, and fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera. It's not true. We are, with the green deals of the 2019, New York State and New York City now are at the top of the league. Um, so before we go back to Evan, how do you, uh, basically it's a, more of a question to you. How do you see this uh, in your experience with the, and also compared to other places in, in the world in Silicon Valley? Because you talk about it in your book, by the way. Uh, first of all, you should know that I don't speak Italian. Uh, uh, I haven't read the book. I do know Gianluca for, I would say, many years, but at least several. Uh, I guess between five and ten years, uh, and uh, have admired him for what he's, uh, what he was doing during the De Blasio administration, and what he's continued to do. Uh, and uh, frankly, I was shocked when he invited me to come to this today. So I honestly, uh, I, this you'll really get a kick out of. I called him yesterday and I said, how many books should I bring down that I can sell outside to the audience? Because I thought this was an event from my book. <laughs> so that could show you how ill-prepared I am. But I'm pretty used to uh, talking and giving talks about innovation and about entrepreneurship and I've spent my whole life doing that uh, I uh, and I do know did know Bill for uh, actually from the first uh, Senate campaign when Hillary ran for Senate and uh, Gabriel Fialco who's sitting here and who's uh, significant other to to Gianluca uh, and I, Bill, uh, Gabriel and I worked on uh, Hillary's first campaign. I can't remember even the date of it. What was it? 2000. 2000. So that's 20, we've known each other 23 years, going on 24. Uh, and, uh, and I heard him talk about, you know, being uh, the grandson of an immigrant. Uh, I am the son of an immigrant uh, and my father came from the Ukraine. Uh, which is interesting in today's in today's context because uh, never until what's happened in the last two years and until I wrote this book did I ever 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 talk about my father coming from Ukraine and that I was the son of an immigrant but today it's a very front and center issue and uh, when I do talks about my book it always comes up about my father coming from Ukraine and I was the son of an immigrant. But as I say to everybody, I don't know about everyone in this audience, but I'll, I'm willing to bet that a large majority of you are children of immigrants. Uh, that's what this, is a, this country's about. It's a mixing pot of people who came from Ireland and came from Italy and my, in my case, my father from Ukraine and from Russia, there were periods when there was enormous immigration. We had the 
potato famine. We had the pogroms, which was the, the really the the uh, basis on which a lot of the immigrants came from uh, Ukraine and Russia. So uh, I, I I get upset, frankly, when I hear about people who are against the immigration that's happening here, uh, and uh, are so negative about it. And I understand there are plenty of problems with with integrating uh, them into the system, into our society, but. Uh, as I say, every one of us, you know, our parents or grandparents or someone in our family went through the, a similar process. I mean, my father came through Ellis Island on a steered ship with five uh, uh, sisters and brothers as an orphan and uh, landed here and then moved out to Ohio to, to some remote relative. And that's the way it all happened. Uh, the whole Lower East Side was all of immigrants and, and all of various parts of the city. So any great, uh, I, I'm a big supporter of immigration and the problems immigrants are facing now. Uh, I, I've been in the venture capital business since 1970. When I started out in venture capital, there really wasn't the word venture capital. It was called the deal business. So you can, uh, today it's kind of a, uh, like you say refrigerator, you can say venture capital. When I started in the business, I had to explain to uh, dates I had, you know, what I was doing. Uh, cause they, they, and then I had to explain to my wife when I got married what I did. I still don't think she ever knew exactly what I did. Uh, but uh, I, I, the venture capital world emerged because of, uh, people who had instincts like I did that were curious about new technologies, new inventions that were taking place. And I've been very, very fortunate to have been involved with what I call uh, revolutions. I mean, I, I would say I, I started my business in the 70s. There were no revolutions in the 70s in terms of technology. Uh, when I started out in the business, the first investment I made was a secondary lead smelting business that took old batteries and turned them, smelted them, refined them, and then sent them back to the battery manufacturers to recover the lead and the, the, the copper and the antimony. Uh, and it was done actually in, in Jersey City. It wasn't done in New York City. And uh, uh, I became f kind of famous in the late 60s because I started New York Magazine, of which I became chairman of the board, and that kind of put me on the map as a, a New Yorker. And so I am really a New Yorker from the bottom of my toes to the top head of my silver hair. Uh, uh, and I've lived here my entire life, uh, and I'm never moving any other place. I grew up in Central Park. My children grew up in Central Park. Their children are growing up in Central Park. Uh, that was our, that was our that was the that was our playground. Uh, I can remember the snowfall of 1947 when your car was covered with snow, and it was there for the entire winter, and there was no one side of the street parking, <laughs> and New York really was a winter playground. Believe it or not, the snow used to stay fall and stay here all winter. We didn't have the same kind of things we have today. But anyhow, uh, when I started out in the venture business. There was no technology in New York. <clears throat> it wasn't, we didn't have the problems of getting uh, uh, scientists or technologists to come here, but it just wasn't the place went, the, the people went. I mean, Fairchild Semiconductor, in, which was in Silicon Valley, was the source, and most of those people came out of Stanford, which kept people around the West Coast. <coughs> and from Fairchild Semiconductor, which really was the center. If you look, and there are some maps around, and there are some charts and uh, which show it, but it all starts with a nucleus of Fairchild Semiconductor, and then the spokes all emanated out of that. And uh, uh, hundreds of companies were people who spun off from that, uh, most prominent of which probably at that time was Intel. Uh, but I went through that chip revolution of the 70s. I went through the personal computer revolution of the late 70s, early 80s, and I 
again, I became famous for having been not the first, but the second investor in Apple Computer, uh, when personal computers were just an idea. The way it started was with a company called Commodore Business Machines, which was a toy virtually, and then Texas Instrument developed a toy, and then Apple Computer uh, developed the original uh, computer that you know, evolved into lots of other versions. But I went through that. And then I went through, and I'm not in that exact sequence, I went through the storage revolution and the uh, disk drive revolution, which were really profound changes. And then I went through one of the most important revolutions of all, the, the uh, cell phone revolution. I invested in the first cell phone company, which was actually started in New York City, but it was, believe it or not, today if you wanted to buy Spectrum for cellular, you would probably pay billions of dollars. The government's first introduction of cell phones was in about 1982 or 83, and they had a lottery, and you could get a cell phone spectrum for nothing. All you had to do was give a very good application to the, uh, uh, to the uh, FT, uh, FCC, and they awarded uh, uh, franchises, and we got actually the, uh, the franchises for Ohio. Uh, uh, and uh, at that time, Motorola and AT&T were the only ones who had wireless carriers, which was a kludgy uh, phone that a couple of, you know, a couple of, more than a couple of cabs would have that they could do radio telephones. And at that time, the estimate was the cell phone penetration would be 2%, uh, uh, ultimately, ultimately, not then, ultimately. And today, it's probably 90 or 100%, so they were wrong. But... Uh, uh, so I participated in that. I participated in the, in the beginning of the internet uh, and what that, that uh, created. And uh, uh, I, I'm probably skipping other revolutions that I've been part of uh, in, in these past 50 years. But the most important revolution of all is what's happening right now. In my opinion, AI, whether it's chat GPT or open AI, are going to change the world. It's going to probably be as important as electricity or maybe fire. Uh, uh, I saw that written, by the way. I didn't invent that. I saw that written someplace, and I thought that was a great analogy. It's so important because uh, it's going to affect every, everything each of us does that's sitting in this audience. And uh, uh, to be part of that revolution is going to be difficult because it's going to take a lot of money huge amounts of capital, whereas a lot of the other technologies that developed over the years didn't take that much. Uh, I skipped one of the revolutions, which was the biotech revolution brought on by Genentech in the, in the 70s. Uh, but uh, uh, New York was a desert in terms of technology. Uh, you couldn't start a technology company here because people gravitated to the West Coast, as Jean Lucas said. At that time when I started, the original venture business really was Silicon Valley in Boston. And uh, that's where everyone gravitated to. And it was very difficult to hire engineers. You can't uh, think about an engineer coming to New York. You could get advertising people to come to New York. You can get film writers. You can get book writers. You can get creative content. But you couldn't get technology people. I was part of the original Information Industry Association, which started here, uh, which had maybe 50 or 100 members. I started the first angel association, New York Angels, which you know uh, today has a robust organization of several hundred people. But in those days, you got 10 lawyers and doctors or a few retired people. Today, it's a very, very uh, viable organization. It's a lot of creative entrepreneurs who've sold their companies have now become angel investors. So the flavor is, is dramatically changed. There was a period of time in the late 70s, the 80s, where no one wanted to come to New York. I mean, you heard this New York drop dead. Uh, the real estate was going broke. Uh, and it was just a very difficult crime on the streets. Nobody wanted to have their uh, graduate from any university and come to New York. Uh, and uh, very frankly, uh, 
uh, Mayor Bloomberg changed that dramatically. It was not changed by Abe Beam, and it was not changed by David Dinkins. It was done by Mike Bloomberg, who really had this vision of, of bringing technology to New York, and uh, Bill de Blasio continued that program, fortunately, and uh, it, 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 you know, it's blossomed. And today, everybody's coming to New York. Everybody's coming to New York. All graduates want to come here. Uh, as bad as things are in the world, you, I'm sure many of you read the story about San Francisco, I think it was in the Times today or Wall Street Journal. Uh, San Francisco is, is collapsing, collapsing. Crime, homelessness on the street, uh, people are abandoning it like, you know, they talk about what, rats leaving the building. Uh, uh, the, the streets are empty, the buildings are half empty. They're going through what New York went through in the mid, in the mid 70s. So today, in the venture capital business, Jean-Luc uh, described it, uh, I think he graduated, exaggerated slightly, uh, uh, Silicon Valley is still the top area. And Silicon Valley is not San Francisco. It's ironic, about four or five years ago, everybody started moving from Silicon Valley to San Francisco because they were, Silicon Valley is a very boring place to be. Very boring. There's nothing happening. It's all happening in San Francisco. That's where the cultural activity is. And so they all went to San Francisco. Now, they're all leaving San Francisco because it's just, just the economic malaise that's happened. And where's the cultural center of the world? It's New York. So New York is very big. I started a firm, um, my first firm in 1970, called Alan Patrickoff Associates, which became Apex, which was Alan Patrickoff Associates International, because we went to 12 cities around the world and, and became a very big firm. But I started a second firm in 19, uh, 2006 called Graycroft, which I started and started in New York and Los Angeles. And today, New York and Los Angeles are two of the major places. Los Angeles is, no one would have ever thought of Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a technology center today. So today, Boston has declined. People, the venture people left Boston. There are still venture there. But what also has happened, and I'm gonna turn it back to Jean-Luc, is that today, venture capital is all over the country. It's in, it's in Cleveland, it's in Columbus, it's in Indianapolis, it's in any city you go to, you could go to and go to a venture capital association, you could meet with venture capitalists, they're every place, because the entrepreneurial bug has, has just infected the whole country. And I think it's proven that uh, you don't have to be in a major hub uh, to be successful. Uh, uh, Steve Case, who started AOL, which I also was an early investor, a AOL, I took out of bankruptcy, out of bankruptcy. People don't know that. That's where it started. Uh, he has something called uh, uh, Revolution of the Rest, uh, rise, rise of the Rest, and is going around in a bus around the country to proselytize starting technology companies all over the country. So today, New York is a technology hub. It's bigger and better than it's ever been. There are all kinds of groups that meet every single week. Uh, and it's a very, very exciting time to be in this business in New York. If you don't mind, I would like to say a couple of things and then I want to pose a question. Actually, actually a couple of questions. Uh, I want to start by uh, a line from Louis Mumford that ends the book. New York is a perfect model of a city, not a model of a perfect city. Uh, the question, but first I wanted to say something, is uh, you end your book with a series of ideas uh, for Italy. And you say that this New York Renaissance can be a great opportunity for Italy. I want to ask you why. And the second question is, uh, there is a chapter which is quite interesting that is uh, about Amazon in New York and how politics, and in particular one single politician, uh, didn't help or 
boycott somehow the possibility of having a larger, bigger, stronger Amazon here in New York. But I leave this to Gianluca. The thing that I want to say is that one of the things that I liked about the book is that it shows how New York is not the exception regarding America, but it's actually America of the future. Is a place where America is already accomplished. It's what the rest of the country can become. And this is very clear. Uh, you know, in, it's not very easy to feel from here how <coughs> common is internationally this disease uh, as dangerous as the pandemic, which is called anti-Americanism. Uh, but it's very common. And I say this because when uh, someone who hates America talk about New York, consider it an exception. But it says from high looking down, say New York it's better because it's different at the subtexts because it's similar to Europe. Yes. Can I say the bad word once? Yeah. Bullshit. You Complete know, you bullshit. can say bullshit. New York. <laughs> of course, New York is more similar to Europe than Oklahoma or Nebraska. This is clear. But New York is purely America, is what America can become. Now, let's go back to the question. The first one is, what is the great opportunity for Italy? I, I agree with what you're saying is that, of course, New York is peculiar, but it's still American. And some people, when I also get a little bit like... Uh, I, I say, yeah, it's full of international. It's a little closer in the model to Europe, whatever you want to say. But when I hear that, it just bothers me. It's one of the cliché that I just... Oh. I, I wrote the book mostly because I'm... Uh, I can't stand clichés. I'm obsessed with factual analysis, with data, with reality. There's a lot of bullshit around the world today. And it's... To me, it's incredible. I don't know with this AI. Yeah, I see, but... There, you know what scares me about AI? And it's not that it can replace people, etc. It's that we live in an extremely paradoxical world in which we, we are living in the age of big data. We never had this amount of data in our, in our history. Never had this amount of capability of analyzing data. Now it's like everything is micro-targeted. Yet, the, whatever is the perception is very out of whack with reality on many fields, and, and I see that, so I'm sorry if I'm not going straight to the, qu to the question, the answer, but, but that's really was, what was one of the driver for me, and especially as an Italian, it's also because I hear a lot of this uh, stupid uh, stuff that, um, but why is it relevant? Because okay, what, what, let it go. It's relevant exactly because, going back to the question, is that because if you don't understand, first of all, your own problems properly, and you have the perception of something and it's not actual reality. And we can say even here, here people think that New York is collapsing. I think they're completely delusional because it's not collapsing. Some problems, okay. But the same for Italy. If you don't realize and you still think that you have the best constitution in the world or uh, we have the best coffee in the world, then who cares? I mean, uh, yes, fine. But if you don't recognize your own problems and were you really strong or not, you're not going to really find any real solution. So the inspiration for Italy, New York is especially in, in a few ways. One is that the entrepreneurial spirit, the resiliency of the city, that is that what has struck me over this 27, eight years I've been here is how resilient the people of the city are and how it churns. You know that, you know that about 30% of the people in the city change completely every, every 10 years or so. So but people get absorbed and they become part of it. And they rise up. I experienced, I arrived and I started to work in finance as a young, uh, young professional in finance and started with a, with a uh, I think it was the Russian crisis. And then we had September 11th. Uh, now we had, you all, if you lived here and you know what it was, um, you had Hurricane Sandy. Oh, no, before Sandy, we had the financial crisis. It was really bad for New York because New York was heavily dependent on the financial industry and insurance industry, both because it was, I think, more than, I think it was 35% uh, of the GDP of the city and more than 40% of the tax revenue came from that. 
Um, but you saw every time a reaction. So from, from September 11th, you had the city that changed a lot of things in terms of how downtown has changed. Uh, the Hudson line, that along, along you know, all the, the Hudson River. Yeah, the High Line was one of them. But I'm saying like all the Hudson, uh, all, all the area along the Hudson has changed, and not just that. Saying West Side High, well, that area there, but it's especially out there. So there were investments. Then Sandy, Sandy brought also Bloomberg was not. I mean, Bloomberg now is celebrated as a champion for climate change, but at the beginning, it wasn't particularly interested. Uh, it is something, because Bloomberg started in 2001. We always forget that, too. But he, Sandy was a wake-up call that we needed to do something. And so you seal that. So that was one thing. And then I think that's a great lesson to learn. How do you, how do you roll your sleeves and not cry on something that we have problems? You know. One thing that I hear about the Italians do a lot is also, we're so good, but it's just the system that doesn't work. Yeah, I know, change the fucking system, okay? Uh, and and uh, I hear that all the time. And so, to go more into some spe something more specific, New York has changed very much after, um, because the leadership, in, 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 Bloomberg started on one side, which is the transformation on becoming a technological hub, et cetera, because he said, we cannot afford another financial crisis that kills the city in, not kills, but like hits the city that way. So we need to diversify the economy. We need to invest in sectors of the future. Um, the Blasio came in, and that's another, that's another problem with perception, honestly, and, and reality, because uh, if you see with the Blasio, there's a lot of negative comments, but then I see, you look at the data. I mean, what are you talking about? Uh, and I think, it, to me, it was a great mayor. So, but he, continued that, and they started to do a lot of other things that are the pre-K for all, the investing in public housing, in, in, increasing the amount of basically welfare that the city does, all because they wanted to reduce in, in, in inequality. The Blas administration gave $6 billion to uh, the, the New York City Housing Authority public housing, was the largest ever, ever, ever given, because that comes from the federal government usually, but it, it dried up with, with Reagan especially. Uh, but the point that I want to make is that it continued, it didn't interfere with what the private sector was doing. The city kept booming, um, and it reached 65 million visitors in 2019, pre the pandemic, uh, the lowest crime rate, the highest uh, private sector jobs. And all I'm trying to say to Italy is that there are things that if you look, instead of looking and you come to New York, because that's what I say in the book, and you ask me to meet with the mayor, because maybe I know them, or like another politician, just to shake hands and then a photo opportunity. And when I tell you, come to see what's happened here at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The Navy Yard is a shipyard of the city. It used to be, they used to build aircraft carriers there. 75,000 people lived, uh, sorry, worked during the World War II. It's in Brooklyn, between Manhattan and Williamson Bridge. Sorry, I just want to describe this, because it is important for people who haven't read the book, and it, for those who cannot read it, it's in Italian. That place went into abandonment, basically. In the 80s, there were probably 10 people working it, until it was donated to the city. And it started slowly to move, but it did change dramatically in the early 2000s, because two entrepreneurs, a real estate investor with a passion for impact in Brooklyn, and a filmmaker, a filmmaker, Scott Cohen. They said that it went to the administration and said, we want to do something with an abandoned um, um, Capannone. How do you say Capannone? Uh, uh, well, yeah, like a fa whereas a factory. A um, anyway, now there are, I think, uh, 20,000 people working there. It's a city within a city dedicated to innovation. Tons of companies flocking from everywhere. All I'm trying to say, you, you can make something that's destroyed and turn it into something completely different and new. And that's what I think is important for Italy, if you do the right coalition between public, private, and academia. And I thought it was another question, but I got carried yes, away. Yes, it's, it's about Amazon. Uh, <laughs> um, a, classical, we'll a classic example of uh, what went wrong between politics and economics in New York. Yeah, because Amazon is a, is a, to me is a, represents a story of um, of failure. 
uh, from all sides, I think, starting from Amazon. I mean, I'm not that I think that they were not actually probably the biggest culprit in, in some ways. Uh, but I don't know if you know the, the story of Amazon. They tried to build a second headquarters here. Uh, so very big investment. They would have employed, I don't know how many, you know, thousands of people. They negotiated a deal without much public um, debate. Uh, that was, I think, a problem, first of all. And they would get $5 billion in, uh, in uh, over 10 years, I think, in uh, tax credits, et cetera. It was mainly a lot, lot the money came from the state and the city. Uh, to make it short, the story is that um, there was opposition locally. AOC, uh, Ocasio-Cortez, led the movement against because they thought that there was creating enormous gentrification and so displace people in Long Island City. Uh, so it was a debate. Is it good for New York? Is it bad for New York? Yes, it's going to create jobs, but you know, who wants another billionaire coming with a helicopter and, you know, because they wanted to really build like, the helicopter you know, where you could land Jeff Bezos. You get caught into these things. Um, my position as a, somebody studying that stuff, I wasn't, I wasn't 100% sure which side to go. I think at the end would have been a good thing for the city. But the point is it failed because we, everybody didn't play the role. Nobody did any community engagement. Nobody went to the people there to explain what this is going to be. Amazon thought that it would, they were dealing with Seattle. That's another thing. That I think. You know, you're dealing with Seattle where they basically rule everything because Seattle is like a neighborhood in, in Brooklyn and of course Amazon you know and I make the the analogy with this uh, Ilva in Taranto I'm from a city where we have the largest steel plant in Europe which is half of it is basically abandoned and it's created a disaster in terms of employment and in terms of uh, environment and, and so they treated they didn't care about anything I know some stuff from I was able to have some privileged information of the stuff they were trying to negotiate and say, give us some money for a great program that I better have Gabriel just started, which is to train uh, teachers to, to teach computer science for free in all the schools, funded by the private sector mostly. They wouldn't give nothing. So they were totally arrogant. They didn't even hire a lobbyist. And so everybody was pissed off, and it failed. And, and that's something that I see happening a lot in Italy. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I just thought, I'd, you know, to contribute to this rather than just uh, here, uh, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, we went to, to uh, Europe and opened up our first office in 1980. Actually, we went to, in 1976, and the environment was so bad in Europe. Dawn, you're here. I was going to... Dawn Barber is probably the most significant leader of technology in this city. That's him. Uh, no. Uh, old friend of mine. I, that's great to see you here. Uh, really, she should be on stage. Because uh, she started lots of things that have ha happened here. But I was going to say is, yeah, uh, is that when we went there in 76, there was no public markets. When I say Europe, I'm speaking of every country in Europe. Not, we happened to have gone to England and then we went to France, but we had, Apex now has an office in Milan. Uh, we're in 12 countries, but in 1976, it was nothing. So we got so discouraged, we formed the business and we went into the merger and acquisition business for five years. And then in 1981, we decided to raise the first venture fund uh, in England, and then in 1982, we raised it in, in France. The word venture capital did not exist. I have the license for uh, Alan Patrikoff Associates called APA uh, Capital Risk, that's what they called it in France, R-I-S-Q-U-E, license. We had to have a license. We were license number one. I have no idea whether they still license people, but then maybe they do. To be in, the, to, in order to be in the venture capital business, you had to have a license. But the big problem, and I wanted to say, was the ethos of risk taking didn't exist in Europe. Please don't be offended. But everybody had good jobs. Everybody who was the type of person who would start a company probably had a contract because that's the way employers employees at a senior level had it. They probably had a driver. They probably had a pension fund. 
And so who the hell wants to take a risk and start a new business? And that was the difference between, and I want to emphasize that, the, the environment in this country has been from day one, way before I got in the venture business, we're risk takers. That, that's what this country is. New York are probably the leaders in risk taking. And that was absent in Europe. And I'm happy to say that today that atmosphere has changed dramatically. But I think for an area to succeed first, you have to have people who are willing to give up secure positions to start something. You need a strong local educational foundation, some form of university that turns out people. And, people, and you have to have an environment that people want to stay in. So I, I, I'm mentioning three ingredients, but for Italy, for any city in Italy, it's all possible, but you have to have these kind of agreement, uh, environment to attract people to come there. And that's why New York is the place it is today. We're all risk takers. We have great educational institutions. And most importantly, and I'm gonna give you the photo, this back again, uh, it all starts with the tone at the top. If you've none of, I don't know if any of you have ever heard that expression before, but that is a, an expression I didn't invent. Uh, remember that, the tone at the top. Mike Bloomberg was the tone at the top. Any great company you see, Cisco, Microsoft, you, you name it, you'll always see Jeff Bezos. That's the tone at the top that builds great institutions that are built, get, get built into something great. And if it's a Me Too company, it doesn't have those kind of people, it's, it's never gonna get there. So you need to start out in an environment, a city, a locality, with someone, whether it's the mayor or someone in the city who kind of wants to make things happen. And then you have to have risk takers, you have to have a good positive environment. And of course, you don't want a lot of crime, you want good things to send your school, you want housing, all those things fit in. But that's what makes a place a successful place to attract people. Yeah, but you said great economic institutions, but you also need good government, you need security, you need housing. Housing is, this, you said like before about housing, that you didn't know much about housing, but uh, it's, it's an extremely critical thing for everyone. If you don't have a roof on your head, right? Uh, it's so in New York is that it's one of the crises that it's kind of permanent. It's very hard to resolve. Um, that's not stopping. No, it's no, no, it's not stopping. But that's, but that's the reason also. But that's why it's also the counter narrative. That people, I hear like New York. Uh, there's an exodus in New York. No, there's no exodus in New York because otherwise prices of rent will go down. So, you know, I agree with you, but uh, you have to also have good government institution that is, uh, to me, government is to be, uh, not only is essential, but also to create scale for many things, but it's essential in the sense that it, when it works as an enabler for new things to happen, uh, and not just like it's some, if you try to replace, like they did, uh, for example, some, some places, even in Europe, but even here they've done it a little bit, they try to replace the market, they create their own venture fund to, to fund the new technology companies that the government runs. They mostly fail, because that's not their job. Um, I, I promised uh, a criticism, can I? Yes, why? About Lincoln, <laughs> because you mentioned Lincoln underlined that he was very different from today's Republican, which is true. There is no doubt that Lincoln can be compared to Donald not. Trump or, or, or even Ronald Reagan. Donald Trump. <laughs> there is no doubt. However, this is only half of the truth because uh, at the time of Lincoln, there was also a Democratic Party, which was pro-slavery. It was very much corrupt. So the Republican conservative Lincoln was much closer to Reagan and the new conservatism, uh, conservative than any Democrat of the time. So saying only that is distant from Reagan is only half of the truth. That's the only Yeah, reason. I have a, the problem is I have an issue with Reagan, that's why. I'm gonna be no, I'm confessing this. No, no, no. I'm it's not, totally no, no. legitimate. I mean, and it's, it's the fact that it's so celebrated. 
for some reason. He's the second most popular president. It's true, it's true. But you know, it's another thing. It's, it's perception reality, right? W so what is your problem? My Reagan? problem with Reagan is this, is that I don't understand why he's so celebrated from the right. Because I like, I, I have my boss that, that, that when I Bring started working in New York wall, here. Mr. Gorbachev. That's a great line. He did something really good, and that was good to bring, uh, you know, to basically span out the Soviet Union. But at the same time, I don't understand. They gave, you, everybody gives too much credit for it. what happened with Reagan was also something that is, I think, very negative. The first thing is that he brought into the conversation uh, certain militant religious people that before were not, okay, they were feeling maybe, uh, how do you say, neglected, fine. And that has lingered, and I think that's the seed that has produced what we have today. But more importantly, uh, is that whatever was happening in terms of funding for housing, for climate, it was completely stopped. We basically wasted 30 years, because with Carter, which I think is that was a great president and is very <laughs> uncelebrated, uh, because I didn't know really much about Carter, because I started to read about Carter, I was like, oh my God, as a failed president, you know, was he, even his own party, like, primaried him. And then I went to see what he did, especially, I started work with climate stuff. It's, it's amazing. The U.S. were at the top of the league in the world with, law, with everything that was climate. The catalytic uh, muffler, uh, marmita catalytic converter, uh, it was it was started and became um, became mandatory in seventy three or something like seventy two. I mean, so solar. If you look at the solar panels, that's that's what I don't. If like you want to take another other wrongdoings of Reagan, he never mentioned the word AIDS until the end of his second mandate, which is horrible. Uh, but you cannot deny that uh, in terms of. <laughs> He's like, you'd rather have Reagan than Trump, I guess, yes. Uh, uh, probably, I, I can probably say that. <laughs> yeah, that's a... Uh, but, um, my, as, you know, as you know, so from the book, I talk a lot about Frank Zappa. I mean, it's... it's, it's my, but Frank Zappa is not from New York. Uh, but uh, he's also the son of Italian immigrants. <laughs> and, you and cannot I, deny that uh, Reagan was instrumental, of course, together with the Pope of the time, John Paul II in the fight against communism, and he won. Yeah, I, I, so on that one, I think... You I, cannot I, deny I, that. I agree with you, and I don't deny that at all. That was actually probably his biggest accomplishment. But, uh, um, yeah, anyway, that was... I, 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 I accept, I accept <laughs> some of the criticism. But it's only I, one I, well, line in the book. I don't think it's no. about Reagan or Lincoln. No, but I also, I'm talking about Zappa. I don't know if you know, but I, I like music. I study music. I, I play with a band sometimes. And I, it's one of my favorite because, because, because of, it's exactly because it's unorthodox. And that's the, the way I, I feel. I didn't know he didn't use drugs. Zero. I it was actually against drugs. Not against in general. They're libertarian. It was not against. It was super free and everything. But it was against people doing drugs, with, especially if you are, if we are on a tour, he didn't do it because he was obsessed with performing very well. If you're on a tour and you do drugs, you put me first risk to get arrested, <laughs> second you know, at the time, and secondly you don't play well, <laughs> so I don't want you to do drugs. And ev but everybody thinks that. So I read another thing about Zappa today that somebody posted was like he was meeting with, I think, John Payne or some, some journalist, like early 70s, that he had one uh, wood, wooden leg, was peg-legged, and he told them, of course, because he was trying to scorn him, and he said, judging from your uh, long hair, I would say you're a girl. And he said, judging from your wood leg, I would say you're a table. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. So, I mean, it, to me, that represents a lot of uh, the stuff that I'd like to express. It's like an orthodox. Yeah, do you want to ask any questions? I, because I, there's stuff that, uh, you know. Um, you, well, you started talking about Italy at some point, and then a lot of other things ah, were yeah. discussed. So, I just wanted you to continue, if you would, the discussion about what Italians can uh, learn, Italian cities can learn from New York's experience, and uh, whether really there are possibilities to change given the sclerotic system uh, in Italy and the mentality there. 
So I had a privileged position when I worked at the city for the first, the, my first stint, uh, no stint, my first uh, really run there, and, and I was basically leading the, the 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 relationship with the other, with the rest of the the world, but just in, in terms of businesses. So our, our job, my job, was to lead the group that would try to bring in more companies from the rest of the world. So I also saw stuff that happened in other cities in the world, not just in New York, and I could compare. And some of the lessons I learned is, first of all, is that if there's a will, there's a way. It sounds very simplistic, but unfortunately, it's like that. It's a political will. I saw one, one of the cities that probably impressed me the most, and till this day, I went in 2014 to represent in New York with the chief technology officer at the time, and is Medellin. Medellin is a city in Colombia, you know. I mean, they, they made a series, Narcos. He was considered, that's the image I had, was like, can I say a bad word to a shithole, like uh, what Trump would say? Like someplace really dangerous, something bad. I was shocked to see like a completely different place. Um, it used to be called, the, it was the most violent city in the world in the, in the 90s. It went through a transformation thanks to enlightened, I would say, mayors. They started with urban really urban planning, something that I also didn't know before I started to work there. And it's, so, I don't want to go into the details, but it's basically, if you use, first of all, I learned one thing, that the local economic development is extremely important, uh, more than macro policies. So you go, in something that's called here place-based economic development. And the way you can make a street, in a way, uh, trees in another place rather than a railroad or something has a tremendous impact on the prosperity of a place. And in Medellin, what they did was actually open up. The city was segregated physically. Um, and it's a reality in many places. In, you know, you, you've heard the expression, you, you were born on the other side of the, of the railroad, right? That's one thing. So the lesson is to learn how to create more... Um, competencies, skills, to do local government. Local government is, aside from the big cities, is not, that you don't have many people, people don't even want to work in government. Uh, here I met this situation which had a lot of young people wanted to work in the New York City government and the different agencies. They, were, they felt it was cool to do it. Of course you need to have a passion. So how do you do that? One of them is that, how do you, you create that? So one of my, my proposals is that create a, some sort of a national school that's similar to the ENA or something like that, create a talent pipeline for people to do urban planning and economic development. The other thing is how to change some of the, the way uh, the, the cities are, the, the mayors are empowered. The mayors in, in, in are the people who are closest to, to the people, <laughs> to the people they serve, and so they can solve real problems. And I think it's important that if you have more empowerment in like the city of New York and in the United States, I think a lot of things would be better. It's not, a, it's not a coincidence, I think, that Milan today is considered, and sometimes it creates envy in the rest of Italy because it's doing much better uh, in many respects. Uh, it's also been more, it become very, very expensive because of the fact that people want to live there. But I think that's, that's another lesson. And then there are other things that, when you come here, that's my, my, my something that I would like to shout. I wish there were TVs here. That's, that's what I would like to say. Don't come here and go to the United Nations. We had hordes of people coming from everywhere in the world. Don't go and stay in the bubble of the United Nations. Yeah, the United Nations uh, General Assembly. Go out, look at what happens, what's happened in New York. Every time I ask these people, whatever they were, a minister, or whatever they were doing, some leaders of something, come see what is the new lab, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Oh, no, nah, 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 I'm not interested. They want to meet with the politician, or they just don't know what they're doing, and they have no idea what's happening. So go look, open your mind, and look what other cities are doing. Now they're talking about the um, short-term rentals, right? How Airbnb, all that stuff. It's a big topic in, in Italy now. Because they realize, and if you go to Rome, half of the, the places in Rome in the center are basically emptied out. Because they all like go rent and sublet to, for short term. I've been talking about this. New York has a law since 2011 that, that forbids short term rental if you're not present in the house. I mean, it, it required changes. All I'm saying is that open, open, go, go, don't go and be a tourist when you go somewhere else. 
So, I mean, it, it does one. Mm -hmm. I think you're calling in an innovation mindset, you know, that's risk taking. Um, but I'm curious to know if you think what comes first, is it the environment that is set up to allow for the innovation or is it something special in the people that creates an environment where there is, you know, a lot of innovation? Can I do a dirty trick, Dawn? You answer the question, come on. <laughs> You, 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 you've been there. I mean, Dawn. I, I believe that we, we're both New Yorkers, Alan, right? So we know, you know, New York, that's what we grew up in. We've seen all the changes. You've seen a little bit more than I have, but I'm getting old at this point, too. You know, I believe what's really special about New York, there's all these things, and you can talk about government and all this stuff, but it's the people. Is it because we're all crowded on top of each other, and we're all kind of competitive, and there's no you know, one note industry. There's lots of industries keeping us all kind of honest, so to speak. Maybe some more so than others. Uh, you know, I, you have, um, you know, you're smarter than I am, Alan. Uh, I learned under you, I'm not, so but, I'm curious but, uh, what you think. Dylan, you might tell them about what you started in terms of the technology associations that, which, you know, used to start with, what, 20, 30 people, and then you couldn't get in? Yeah. You yeah, no, I, Alan's talking about a New York Tech meetup that I started with Scott Heiferman, who's an entrepreneur who Alan and I both know and are friends with. And um, it became a very large organization for the tech community in New York. And one of the things that was important to me was to grow the community and to be very inclusive and to sort of allow anyone in. It, it's a challenge in New York. Alan's saying, you know, it was hard to get in because we didn't have the space, not because we didn't want to let people in. But it, it sort of became a hub for, um, for entrepreneurs to uh, display and talk about what they were doing. You know, one of the things interesting about Silicon Valley, which is an unknown thing, and it's a very, <laughs> it's a funny thing. In Silicon Valley, there were places that entrepreneurs, technology people, there were hubs, restaurants, bars, where everybody would go to. New York did not have that until, I think, what do they have, Bubba's now? I mean, they've got, they're, they're really. It's it, all it, over. It, what, it's, it's, it's all over. Yeah, it, there's not, a, but, but there's no real hub where people go to. I think you, you have to create an environment. Uh, and I think that's what this book is about, is be, you know, Create, it, it's possible to do it every place. You know, I, I, I really believe in what Steve Case is doing, the rise of the rest. I mean, yeah. it, it's just saying that every, it's possible to have entrepreneurial activity and, and venture and new startups and entrepreneurism in any city in the world. Yeah. You also need, uh, you need a place where there's creative people. All right. It's more fun. Our slogan was, when we started the talk, is because you had to compete with Silicon Valley, was like, okay, you go to San Francisco, and you code 14 hours a day, finish your day, you want to have a beer, you go have a beer at the local bar, and you're going to meet. Everyone is coding all 14 hours a day, it's like you, it's probably a white man or something, or Asian, uh, the most. And in New York, you can code 14 hours a day, you go to a bar, and maybe after you met 50 people, you find out someone like you. In the meantime, you met a lawyer, a doctor, somebody who works in the restaurant. Uh, you know, it's, it's the fact that it's a very diverse, and I think that's important. Um, I, I, is an, I, I, I guess coming from another New Yorker, um, I, Alan, I can't escape asking, um, you know, having been alive, as we've all been saying, through different um, generations, and I re can remember as a young girl, Mayor Lindsay, nobody's brought up his name, but he was another great mayor that I think True. did incredible things for our city, and I'm grateful because really Central Park was everybody's playground thanks to, you know, those mayors of once upon a time. But, you know, like Jay Kriegel was for Mayor Lindsay, you know, and now then we had Dan Doctoroff for Bloomberg. You know, let's talk about building tech and, and sustainability and, and possible businesses. I think that I'm wondering if you had to talk about now, you know, who do you see as a promise for the future? I mean, 
I couldn't believe that, you know, I, uh, Obama, Clinton, Hillary Clinton was a, who do we have to look forward to? Can you give us any insight into that? Well, I, John Luke would be better equipped to uh, give you the answer of, of who, I, I don't think there's any person who stands out now. I, uh, isn't John Luca that, isn't that of, sad? John Luca was one of the people in, in the last administration. I don't know who it is in, in today's administration, uh, uh, although I think Eric Adams, I, I will tell you, he's very active in the entrepreneurial uh, community and technology, and he's, uh, he's trying very hard. I've been to a lot of things that he's you know, spoken at, attended, and I think he's very sincere about it, but um, I don't think he's got a, a head of economic development who perhaps is you know, leads that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, yeah, it's, it's a hard question. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, well, if, somebody will come up, I think. It's, uh, especially in a crisis uh, in general, then they, pr they produce uh, good uh, leaders in some point. Um, you want to? I don't have the answer. I voted Biden last time. I hope to vote a new Democrat next time. Um, so building off of these, um, these discussions around innovation and also on um, the real estate market as well, um, how do you strike the balance between fostering a culture of entrepreneurship and innovation um, and uh, creating, creating more of an environment where um, new companies, new technology is being developed in New York while also preventing the um, massive income inequality that's come with it, um, the gentrification in areas, um, particularly in Brooklyn, parts of Manhattan as well. I gotta be honest, I think it's inevitable, part of it. So what you have to do, I believe, is that to fight it in a sense that you mitigate it and you provide uh, ways to, um, with, with the, that's why the government is critical because otherwise the market is not gonna provide that. You have to try to provide more housing, try to provide more services, more skill development that comes from the public sector. Uh, healthcare is another important part that uh, people don't know when New York spends a lot of money in healthcare. Um, I don't know much. Is that what is it? The total at fifteen billion, probably. You know, but you know, it runs the twelve largest hospital in in New York in the city, but it's it's still not enough. So, uh, unfortunately, I think when you have success, in some ways, you also create the you sow the seeds of some of the problems because housing, as you said before, is like rents go up because people want to live here, and you, but you don't have enough supply because. Of, for either reasons, also for nimbism, you know, you don't want a new building, etc. Um, I just want to give her like allow me for another two minutes for if you want. What I remember about Bloomberg, and he's like. I'm not around, haven't been alive long enough to have a favorite mayor, but uh, I remember in 2005 he wrote this article and everybody kind of laughed at it. I forgot what magazine it was in, but he spoke about having more greenery and the parks being elevated. He spoke about quality of life. He spoke about so many things that, I mean, it was, it all came into fruition. Right? So what I think that we need to look for in any political leader is, I think he focused on the quality of life, and he really didn't give a shit if you liked him or not, because whatever he, whatever brain spew he had, he executed it. Because think about it, when he, when he opened up all the bike lanes, people were pissed, right? Uh, yeah. When he talked about there was a time that he was like, oh, we don't have to recycle because we don't really send the, <laughs> we don't send anything to recycling anyway. Then the environmentalists went against him, but I still don't think that we really 
recycle. Oh, I, I I'm agree. just saying, don't, don't attack I, me. I think there's a little bit of a, sometimes a golden age uh, of a Bloomberg, which yeah. I don't particularly agree And with. one last thing, I know I, I said I wouldn't be long. Uh, the gentleman here was talking about gentrification. Again, with Bloomberg, he, went up. he spoke, no, I'm just saying, one point that Bloomberg did, he... Uh, he said that the, the boroughs were going to be the next neighborhoods, right? There was a time that everybody was just focusing on Manhattan, but Manhattan could only be but so big. Look at Long Island City. When I was 19 years old, I had a job at Citibank, and I went to Long Island City. There was only the Pepsi building and Citibank training. And now look. Yes, it's expensive, but New York has always been that neighborhood that you could be on one block and across the street is a millionaire. We got and a, right across the street we got is the a, money. We got a, thank you. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I don't completely agree. Because um, also the Blasio did a lot of stuff for the environment. And I want to give, before we close, finish some of the questions. Let me just some of the things that I was thinking. And I, if you want to look at them too, is New York is the Green Deal. And I think it's extremely advanced. Massive investments are coming for to, make, to electrify the state and the city. Um, there's a local law, law called lo Local Law 97 that imposes strict limits on how much emissions every building can have. It's the first in the world. Um, there have been massive investments with Bloomberg and the Blasio too in, in making the city greener and resiliency to protect from the waters. Another thing that I think we overlook is we have a voting, the, the way we vote, I think it's a good law. We just use it for the, la for the first time with, with the last election. It's called ranked choice voting, which is, is trying to bring more participation, because otherwise people don't participate here you don't vote. Finally, another interesting thing is that New York has a law um, for campaign funding. Everybody talks about campaign funding, how money is so influential in politics. It's a great law. It's one of the best that's been imitated in other places. Um, the law of the state is terrible. The law of the city is, is the matching funds. It encourages small donations. And so up to $175, $200, the city, which is the public uh, funding, uh, matches up to eight times. And so you don't have to go and, and these are all, all little things that you can look around and if somebody is not from New York and was just asking me what, what is uh, useful and inspirable, that's one of the things, I mean, practical stuff. Uh, I think, shall I just, you want to close it then? <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you, Antonio, very much. I enjoyed it. Alan, thanks, and thank you all.